Hi all, and welcome to the Medical AI Lab reading group session. This week, we have lab member Mark Endo present masked autoencoders or scalable vision learners from Facebook AI or Meta AI research. Um, Mark, looking forward to your talk, take it away. Great, thanks Pranav. Uh, so yeah, as Pranav said, I'll be presenting mass autoencoders by scalable vision learners. Uh, this paper was released at the end of last year by the Facebook AI research members shown below. So the problem that the authors are trying to tackle here is that with large architecture and hardware advancements, vision models today can easily overfit large amounts of images and they can demand even more data, which is often, often publicly inaccessible. So the field of NLP has a solution to this, particular in, particularly in self-supervised pre-training. So one such example of this is using mass autoencoding as is done in BERT. And as we can see here, for example, with the string, let's stick to improvisation in this skit, what you do in BERT is you randomly mask a per certain percentage of the tokens, let's say 15%. In this case, the word improvisation is masked and the pre-training task is to try to predict that mass word improvisation from all of the English words. And what this allows for is it enables generalizable models. So, the idea of mass autoencoders has been applied to vision as well, actually, and some of the research precedes BERT, uh, but the progress in vision lags behind NLP. So the research question that the authors try to answer is how should you design an optimal method for vision encoding? Uh, but to first answer that question, the authors try to get behind what makes mass autoencoding different between vision and language. So we'll go about this second question first. Um, the first difference is in the architectures. So until recently, the architectures in NLP and in vision were quite different. So mask tokens and positional embeddings don't work well with CNNs, uh, which was used predominantly in vision. But now there are the advancement of vision transformers. So this architecture difference can be solved. The next difference is in information density. So in languages, um, languages are highly semantic and information dense. And when only a few words are missing, the task is sufficiently sophisticated. However, in images, they have heavy spatial redundancy and it can be quite easy to recover information. So on this example of the slide, to try to uncover that mass word deer on the blank jumped over the fence, that's gonna be a much more sophisticated task than it would be to try to fill in 15% missing pixels as shown in the gray boxes with the deer jumping over the fence. So in order to over in order to overcome this, the authors propose a pretty simple solution actually, which is just you can mask a very high portion of the random patches. So in this picture, they're masking about 75% of the path of the image uh, into these masked patches, which means that it's going to be pretty sufficiently difficult to try to solve this problem, hoping to create these uh, high quality latent representations. So the last difference is in the role of the decoder. So the output is of lower semantic value here, particularly working with pixels. Uh, so the decoder design will play a key role in determining the semantic level of the learned latent representations. And I'll talk about this more later on. So with all those differences taken into mind, the authors propose mass autoencoders or MAE. And this is just a general overview of how the architecture works. I'll go into each step individually, but basically you take a large random subset of the image patches around 75% of them, and then you mask them out. Uh, the encoder or the vision transformer is applied to a very small subset of these visible patches, particularly it's only applied to the image patches that aren't masked out. So the ones that are, are not passed into this encoder. Then the mass tokens are introduced after the encoder and the decoder, and then the full set of those encoded patches and the mass tokens is processed by a, a decoder that can reconstruct the original image in pixels. And then it's critical to note that after this pre-training of the image reconstruction task, the decoder you can throw away and you can use that uh, encoder or the uh, vision transformer to be then applied to uncorrupted images or these, you know, these full images for recognition tasks downstream, such as classification tasks or object detection or semantic segmentation. 
So going step by step, first we have the encoder. So the encoder is just a, a standard vision transformer, but it's applied only to those visible unmasked patches. So the benefit on only operating on the small subset of patches beyond just learning about more information from the task being more difficult is that it allows for training very large encoders with only a fraction of the compute and memory because we're only processing a very small subset of the image. So just going into a bit more depth, the encoder embeds the patches by using a linear projection and then with added positional embeddings. And then it processes the resulting set via a series of transformer blocks, basically straight out of the um, vision transformer paper. And just a little bit more background. So for each of the different patches, basically it will just unroll it and then um, into a, a vector and then it will multiply that vector by embedding ma matrix. And then that can then be fed into the transformer along with these positional embeddings, which are needed because unlike CNNs or something that have this relational knowledge and uh, the fact that you're going through these filters uh, with transformers, it won't have that positional knowledge without adding these sort of position embeddings. So the next step is the decoder. So uh, the input to the decoder is the full set of tokens, which includes the encoded visible patches, as well as the mass tokens. And for this decoder, you add the positional bendings to all of the different tokens so that it knows where in the image each is. Uh, and as said before, the decoder is only used during the pre-training for the reconstruction tasks. And in this way, the architecture can be flexibly designed in a way that's independent of the encoder design. So specifically, you can have these very large encoders that you're gonna use on your downstream tasks, uh, but you wanna keep your decoder pretty small because it is having to process every single patch. So yeah, the, the full set of tokens only gets processed by this decoder. All right, and then lastly, I'll briefly talk about the reconstruction aspect. So the model reconstructs the input by predicting the individual pixel values for each of the masked patches. And then the loss function is computed by the mean squared error between the reconstructed, reconstructed and the original images for only those masked patches. So, one technique that the authors use is they can normalize these image values using the standard um, just mean and standard deviation normalization techniques. They also experiment with some other normalization techniques, but they find that just a standard normalization works fairly well. All right, so these are some um, just basic results from the paper. So first, the left column is just training by scratch. Uh, on the just original vision transformer. The second is with the author's implementation of the model. And then the third is using their mass autoencoder technique. So we see that there is uh, an increase as you would hope to see from this self-supervised pre-training technique. Um, going more into detail about some of these experiments. So first the authors look at the effect of the masking ratio on the performance and they do two setups. First on end-to-end -end fine tuning, where they just take the encoder and then um, use that to end-to-end -end fine tune a classification task. And then they also do a setup with linear probing where they'll freeze most of the model and then just add a linear classifier and just train that linear classifier for the particular task. So as we can see here for the fine tuning method, once you reach this certain threshold, of uh, it looks like 40%. The masking ratio doesn't impact too much and the performance is uh, pretty stagnant. But for the linear probing version, we can see that as you increase the masking ratio, it seems to continuously go up until you reach that sweet spot of about 75%. So kind of the logic on why there's these differences is that in linear probing, we can't learn as much as an end-to-end -end fine tuning on that last stage. So you are, because you are just training that linear classifier. So it would make sense that you would need this larger masking ratio in order to learn more in the pre-training process. Uh, and that way you can get better latent representations that you can apply to your test. All right, the authors also go through a series of ablations. So I'll just go through each one uh, left to right and top to bottom. The first one is that they are looking at the decoder depth. So as we can see, 
for end-to-end -end fine tuning, the decoder depth doesn't make too much of a difference, but on linear probing, we see that you actually do need a pretty deep decoder in order to get better accuracy. Um, sort of one explanation for this, at least that the authors give, is that there is a gap between the pixel reconstruction task, that's this pre-training, and then the recognition task later on. So the last several layers in an auto encoder are a more specialized, uh, they're more specialized for reconstruction, but then they're gonna be less relevant for recognition. So a reasonably deep decoder, the authors uh, posit, can account for the reconstruction specialization, and it can leave those latent representations at a more abstract level in the encoder. So the second experiment that they do is looking at the decoder width, and they find that the decoder can be narrower than the encoder. Um, you know, this experiment mostly just says that well, with the mass autoencoding, the decoder can be pretty lightweight, which is obviously what they would want because it is having to process all of the different tokens. So the third, the third ablation is on whether or not to pass the mass tokens into the encoder or the vision transformer. And they find that not only does leaving out those mass tokens in the encoder improve the speed of the model, but it also improves the performance, specifically in the linear probing case. So in this case, there's a gap between the pre-training and deploying, specifically when you are passing your um, mass token into the encoder. So if you have it where your encoder has this large portion of mass tokens in its input and pre-training, then it may kind of confuse the model later on when it's trying to do its final task, where it, these, um, these mass tokens won't actually exist in the uncorrupted images. So it, it's maybe not uh, trained in the, the correct way if you were to, let's say, include all of these mass tokens. So the fourth one is on the normalization or the reconstruction target. So the authors do find that if we have some sort of normalization, with the norm, it's going to perform better than without any normalization. The reason for this is that it enhances the contrast locally of each of the different patches. The authors also implement some more advanced normalization techniques, such as PCA or DVAE from DALI, but they find that these aren't really improving performance in any way, so there's no real reason to, to implement these methods. The next one is on data augmentation. So as we can see that uh, the crop and random size, this is going to perform better than none, but you actually don't need much augmentation. So this is actually a pretty surprising result that the authors found, where most self-supervised methods are going to rely heavily on augmentation in order to, for the performance to work in order for the models to be generalizable. But in this case, they're finding that they only need minimal or no augmentation. The reason that the authors give for this is that the role of the data augmentation is mainly performed in the random masking step, where they are choosing which patches they should map, uh, they should um, blank out. Yeah. And then the last one is on the mask sampling. So um, there's a couple of different mask sampling techniques that you could use. One of them, the one that kind of makes the most sense is just to randomly sample which of the patches you're gonna mask out. And that is the one that performs the best, but there's also other methods such as block and grid. So this slide just shows the different methods on masking them out. So we have random on the left where it looks like, yeah, you're just randomly selecting certain uh, patches to mask. And then you could also do a block method where you take a whole block of the image and mask that out. This one's showing about 50% of the image being masked out. And then you could also do a grid where you have this like alternating grid-like structure of uh, masking out and not masking out. So if we look at the results, and again, these are, or these are kind of cherry-picked results, uh, but kind of the overall story here is that you want the task to be sufficiently sophisticated, but you don't want it to be too difficult or, or make it difficult for the model to learn interesting representations. So 
on the middle one, the block, this seems like a, a bit too hard of a difficult task or, or the, the model can't really learn that useful latent representations. And then the grid seems to kind of be too easy or structured for the model to pick up on. So those are some of the ablations. The next thing that they look at is the comparison with self-supervised pre-training methods. So they compare their mass autoencoding method against some of the uh, previously used pre-training methods such as Dyno, MoCo, or BEIT. And they find that their method performs pretty well, which they would hope. Uh, and then kind of most importantly, as you are increasing your size of your uh, transformer or your vision transformer, your performance is also going up. This is a pretty important thing because you wanna make sure that your models are not overfitting the data that they're being trained on. And we can see that even though we're increasing these sizes, we're still not overfitting and we're getting good uh, performance on our eventual task. Uh, so this is a comparison of comparing the method for, uh, against supervised pre-training methods. So the bottom graph here is on the, the supervised, uh, looking at the image net 1K. And then the, the line just above that is on the supervised version, but just the author's implementation. And then the, the third line from the bottom, the blue one is on the mass autoencoders. And we can see here that the performance is going up as we increase the size of our encoder which is definitely a good result. And then just the one above that is a supervised version, but it's training on a lot more data. So in this case, it's training on the JFT 300 million data set. And then just the last couple of things to go over. So this is, these are some results of using different downstream tasks such as object detection or semantic segmentation or transferring, transfer learning on a different classification data set. So for object detection, we see that the mass autoencoding method works very well. Uh, for semantic segmentation, we get similar results where it's beating the previous methods. And then for transfer learning, we see that on the INAT and the places data sets, it's also beating the previous best. So all of these seem to be pretty good results. And then last slide here is on how we can use the reconstruction task and actually show that it's very generalizable. So here we have a model that's being trained on a masking ratio of 75%, but then the authors are applying the inputs with higher masking ratios and seeing what the generated outputs are. So the kind of basic method is just the the second to the left one, not 75%. But then we can see that if you are to pass in an image with an insanely high masking ratio, say 95% on the right, we see that the generations are actually pretty believable. They're not exactly what the original picture is, and they definitely do worse than what the, the mask 75% or 85% have. But they actually seem like pretty good, plausible generations that if I was to look at those 5% of patches, I could definitely not come up with something as close to the original as the model could. So yeah, that was my presentation and I hope you all enjoyed. Thanks, Mark. That was great. Thanks.